Yeah. Oh man, this is this is a great question. In the almost two years that I've had this channel covering Starlink and SpaceX news, I've been simultaneously trying to interview someone with SpaceX on camera. Now that has proven to be very difficult and hasn't happened until now. Some of you know I just wrapped up a week in the Washington DC area covering the AIAA SciTech Forum. And during that forum, we heard from the VP of Build and Flight Reliability, Bill Gerstenmeier or Gerst. I'm so excited because he actually was able to talk to me after his panel discussion about turning sci-fi into a reality. Gerst uh, with yep, SpaceX, nice, yeah. nice to meet you. Good and you. I got some, some questions for you. Are you ready? Okay. Oh, sure. Great. Yeah. So I want to know, how are your lessons from NASA's shuttle program being applied to SpaceX operations? Yeah. Oh, man. This is, this is a great question. So I would say early on, if you look at shuttle, if you think about the first shuttle flight, we put two crew member on this vehicle that had never flown before. So there was no pre-test flight. There was no uncrewed test flight. We put crew on this vehicle and they went to space. We flew at Mach 25 and we landed on a runway in California. So you, you think the agency is not creative and innovative. I think in reality, NASA was extremely creative and innovative. And what was interesting is I was very young in my career. I had been at uh, Johnson Space Center about a year before the first shuttle flight. I was in the flight control room for the first shuttle flight. I don't think I fully appreciated how risky or how big an adventure this test flight was of the first flight. And I used to, I would jog with John Young and Bob Crippen, so I knew them personally, they were my friends, but I had no comprehension of the risk or the dangers involved about what we were gonna go do. And I think the reason was I worked with the greats from Apollo. So they had already landed humans on the moon. Right. And they saw this test flight is not a big deal. But they wanted to push the technology, they wanted to advance from Apollo, so I see that same thing now. In SpaceX, I get a chance to see the same thing. What are those boundaries? I work with a tremendously young group of folks, yeah. and, and they don't understand the risks and other things. I understand some of them, but I don't want to hold them back because I wasn't held back, I was pushed forward. So how can I, take what I've learned, yeah. keep us from doing a really dumb thing, but still push and learn and learn as fast as we can. So I see a tremendous analogy between what I get to go do and I, I feel tremendously blessed that in my early career I had all this exposure and now in my late career I still get to do these same things that get me excited every day. Well, and I'm sure SpaceX is so grateful to have you there. How would you compare the aggressive risk tolerance at SpaceX with NASA's much more conservative approach to risk tolerance, and how does this affect the pace of innovation? Yeah, again, I think, you know, I think, again, it's, it's a function of the agency, right? Where the agency was taking huge risks at the beginning, and, and I go back, and again, I look at some of the Apollo things, and and we didn't have funds, but we, we had this drive that we had to beat the Russians to the moon. It was a critical national thing. Mm -hmm. That same motivation kind of drove the agency to take big risks and move forward. And I think the public accepted that risk was there. But then the agency became more mature, and then you couldn't tolerate failure. Why didn't you deliver? Or, right. or you know, as we just discussed in this session, I think science fiction got confused, and it seemed that, hey, this stuff is easy. It's not really no. easy in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. But I think as a new company, the public is more tolerant of the risk and is, is more accepting of, hey, we're learning and this is difficult. And so I think both NASA and SpaceX, if the public can look at what we're trying to do to make us a multi-planetary species and move human presence in the solar system, this is a huge goal. Yeah, there's gonna be some stumbling along the way. There may even be loss of life and, and, it's, and it's tough. And you need to recognize that it's there, but that doesn't hold you back from continuing right. to push and continuing to move forward. So on my channel, Ellie in Space, we have a lot of Starship fans. So I would like to ask you some questions. I know you probably can't answer them all, but uh, let's get started with, is a flame diverter ever planned? And if so, what and when so concrete cannot fly up and break fuel lines or more? 
I mean, again, it, I probably shouldn't talk about it. We don't. I don't think we have any plans for that. I think we're fine the way we are. But, it, but I can't really go into too okay. much detail. Right? Okay. Well, we'll talk a, a, a more vague question. Um, well, maybe not vague. Do you have any um, update about the progress of Starship operations at Kennedy Space Center in Florida? Again, I think you can you can see what's being constructed, the launch pad and some of the facilities there. Uh, again, I think we're going to use Boca as a test facility. Uh, again, I think you'll see the, these, this flight we're going to go do here fairly soon in the next couple months. I don't expect it's going to go perfectly fine, and and that's okay because right. we're going to go learn. We've got we've got other rockets ready to go fly. We're going to learn from this event, and we'll go ahead and advance technology as we move forward. So, again, I think there's a there's a really a big contrast between the way NASA does things and the way SpaceX is allowed to do sure. things. <laughs> uh, I would say in the Artemis mission that we just got to see. You know that flight had to absolutely go perfect and so all the decades of work that went in it had to absolutely achieve every objective it had with no mistakes and the NASA team did a great job and it all worked out well in the SpaceX world we're we're not of that held to that same standard it's how can we learn so right. so this this vehicle this 33 engine vehicle that's going to be transformative we're going to learn some things as we go out over the Gulf. We picked a trajectory that's safe from a public risk standpoint. We, we, we skirt below or above Cuba or through the, through the gap mm. there where we're not flying over populated areas. And then we're going to dispose of the ship, you know, on the Pacific Ocean, just a little bit south of Hawaii. But that's on purpose. So we chose a profile where we're not going to hurt anybody mm -hmm. if something doesn't go exactly right but it may not go exactly right, and that's not a failure. That's an actually advanced learning. Right. So I'm super excited to see this next generation of heavy lift vehicle take flight and fly in a different way. But I think it's important to, to not judge SpaceX's performance against NASA or NASA against SpaceX. We're both trying to accomplish goals in the same way, but we may do it a slightly different way. Well, I can tell you, I have a lot of global fans, so the world is really excited about Starship. Can you give us any insight on the point-to-point -point capability that, you know, in those some of those first videos got us really excited about Starship's capabilities? I mean, again, I think you'll, you'll see that even in the first flight, right? It's effectively a point-to-point -point mission, so we'll, we'll see how yeah. all that goes. So considering the role you played at NASA as the Associate Administrator for Human Space Flight, what are the biggest hurdles you see for getting the Starship system safe for ascent, descent for human passengers? I think the advantages is of a, is a flying and, and also being willing to make changes to systems. I think sometimes you see change as a risk, right? So you change something and it adds a risk, but then if that holds you back from making an improvement that can actually improve performance, you should be making those improvements. So I think the key thing is keeping a really high learning attitude. So as we fly Starship, we're going to learn more and more about how it operates. We're going to have to make changes. In fact, some of the newer Starships are all ready to go, ready to go fly. They're, on, they're down at Boca now. They've got changes in them and upgrades, so it's not exactly the same as the first one because we know there's some weaknesses in the first one that we wanted to fix, so that's there. But I think that attitude of being willing to change, to, to learn what the vehicle, how it actually operates and how it flies, and don't pick like a specific number of flights or a specific set of objectives. Right. I think you'll see the performance from the vehicle when we determine it's safe to then go put crew on and go move forward. But again, I think let us experiment, let us <laughs> learn, let us see how this vehicle really flies and then learn what we need to fix. So we'll figure out what's not working right and we'll figure out how to go fix it. How often are you down there in Boca Chica? Uh, periodically, I, I'm going down there this weekend so we'll you know, whenever I get a chance, I go down. I do more Falcon and Dragon activities mm -hmm. than I do uh, Starship activities. Every launch has a high risk associated with it, and it's. And I don't fear the failure, but what what are we going to learn from this launch? And are, and are we taking this risk for a certain benefit? So I trade that benefit of what we're going to get out of this activity versus the cost of doing the activity, and what is the potential for learning? So I think when it's interesting being in a quality organization, instead of being kind of the, the brakes or the thing that slows down the project, I, I tell my team we're the clutch. So we create a momentary pause in the chaos so we can shift to a higher gear and run even 
faster than the team ever thought they could. So instead of doing inspections and finding problems later, I'm now incentivized to actually reduce the uh, variability in the production so I have a higher first pass yield through the assembly line and I don't need to do inspection. So I'm actually, as a quality person, I'm removing inspection. So I really hope that you enjoyed that interview. Again, he couldn't answer all the questions that we had for him about Starship specifically. My Patreons pooled some great questions and I will save those questions for a future interview, maybe with someone else from SpaceX. Hopefully I will be able to get a little bit more specific information. But regardless, this feels like a huge achievement for the Ellie and Space Channel has been unlocked. If you think about it, two Februarys ago, I just posted my first video about Starlink. That was kind of the birth of the channel. One February ago, I published my interview with Scott Manley that I flew to San Francisco to see him at his house and interview him because, you know, he's our favorite space tuber, one of the favorite space tubers. And here we are almost in February and we've been able to finally get someone a uh, very high level person from SpaceX on camera. And it's really great to be able to cover this full time. I'm so grateful to do what I'm doing. So um, really excited and I hope that you guys enjoyed that interview. I was also excited to see that my Starship wet dress rehearsal video has almost 100,000 views. If you wanna watch that video, you can watch it. I've linked it here in the corner, but thank you so much for the support for the channel. It uh, was a really great experience at the SciTech Forum. I met so many people. I was honored to be sort of the host of their studio so i don't even know how many people i interviewed total probably close to 30 people including university students and longtime industry experts so i'll be releasing some of that content over the next few weeks but i'm so excited to share it with you and i hope that you enjoy it oh and one more thing before i go you may notice that i'm wearing a zipped jacket version of my ellie and space hoodie but that's not it as you can see we have the rapid iteration design on the back. So many of you requested this. You said that you wanted a, um, a design on the back instead of just on the front. And I finally got my own version in the mail and I love it. <laughs> um, so if you would like your own zip up version, I will link that in the description of this video. Oh, I did want to add one more thing, which is a great example of why having a team is really helpful. I recorded the interview with Gerst on two separate cameras. One of them was filmed with an iPhone, the other one was filmed with my camera and my stick mic. For some reason, and I've never had this happen, my stick mic wasn't offering any sound and I had no idea because I had someone else helping hold the camera. and. <laughs> I, I got on the plane to edit my video and I realized that that had no sound with like such an important person at SpaceX. So it was, it was great uh, coincidence or fate that we decided last minute, hey, wh why don't we get an iPhone angle as well? So great to work as a team and great to have backups because even if you <laughs> have been doing this for almost 10 years, things go wrong. So I'm really, really, really glad. I would have been so devastated. Um, if there was no sound on that.